What is up dudes and dudettes? I think I have something very special for you today. Today I'm gonna be sharing with you one of my favorite strategies. I use this with about 10% of my portfolio. I only discovered it two years ago. I wish I had discovered it a decade ago, but alas, here we are. I came across this article on Seeking Alpha. The article was written by Logan Kane and it was titled, the strategy that beat the S&P 500 by 16 percentage points since 1928. I'm like, okay. All the time folks are talking about strategies that work. If you wanna beat the S&P 500, do this, do that. And I have back tested most of these, any strategy that somebody says works and it has some fundamental guidelines to follow, I have back tested it. And most of them do not work. This one, I have done my own tests and it does work. So stay tuned. I'm about to show you exactly what to do to set up the strategy so you can run it yourself if you want to. And then I'm gonna show you the details of why it actually works. Let's roll. And away we go. Okay, I'm about to nutshell the strategy for you. It looks like this. When the S&P 500, we'll call, it, we'll call it ticker SPY, when SPY is above the 200-day moving average, we'll use a simple moving average. When SPY is above the 200-day simple moving average, buy and hold UPRO or SPXL. Both of those are triple leveraged S&P 500 funds. Whenever the stock price of the S&P 500 of SPY falls below the 200-day moving average, sell and hold in cash. This strategy has averaged about 28% per year since 1928. Now, I, I know that leverage, leverage ETFs have only been around, I think UPRO has been around since 2009. Uh, so these were simulated back tests, which gives some people some pause, but it's pretty easy in an Excel spreadsheet to, to calculate uh, daily returns the same way these leveraged funds are calculated. The basis for the core of the strategy was submitted by Jeremy Siegel, who is a Nobel Prize winning professor. Uh, he wrote a book called Stocks for the Long Run. And he basically concluded that if you hold the S&P 500 above the 200 day moving average and then sell the S&P 500 or close your positions whenever uh, the stock price falls below the 200 day moving average, that you will underperform the market overall, but you seriously limit your risk and you would have avoided most of, if not all of the crash in 2000, between 2000 and 2002, and then the 08, 09 financial crisis as well. So there were some boys over at Pension Partners. They wrote a paper called Leverage for the Long Run. They, they did the play on stocks for the long run that Jeremy Siegel wrote, and they won the Dow Award for it. Leverage for the Long Run shows that while it's very hard to time the market, it is not so hard to figure out when volatility is going to happen. That means when the market's more shaky. And when the market is more shaky, that is what kills these leveraged ETFs. That's what causes the decay. In their paper, they proved that volatility is almost twice as high when the S&P 500 is below its 200-day moving average. And this makes sense. When the market is kind of in a decline, uh, you, you have more people panic selling and you have more investors jumping in, buying bigger share, more shares at one time. And so it causes the market to be more shaky. If you do a quick internet search, you will find dozens of articles that will show you why leveraged ETFs don't work. And the premise behind all of these articles are that leveraged ETFs decay over time. Volatility decay. I'm not gonna get into volatility decay today, but there are hundreds probably of videos on volatility decay. Volatility is not good for leveraged ETFs. So by using the 200 day moving average, you're not using it as market timing so much as you're using it for volatility timing. By minimizing the volatility, you miss most of volatility decay. A couple of cons to this strategy. If you are naturally a buy and hold investor, then you probably don't look at your stocks every day. And if you're not in the habit of looking at your stocks every day, that could, be, that could be a con. A lot of people like me who are into the stock market, they look at it all day, every day, so they'll never have to really worry about their position going south without them knowing about it. They will know about it. And so if you're a buy and hold investor 
and you want to incorporate something like this, know that a potential con is you'll have to look at your investments more closely more often. If the market starts to move against you, you want to be able to exit whenever the price falls below the 200 day moving average. Another con is that your account can see massive drawdown. I don't necessarily mean uh, going negative, although that could happen. I mean, if you were up 80% one day and then a week later, you're only up 40%, that can be emotionally taxing. <laughs> That's right. Even though you didn't lose the trade, uh, you see a lot of that with these leverage ETFs. They go to the moon and then they go down to hell, okay? And then back to earth again. Let me give you an example of how the strategy would have played out during this crisis we're in. I know a lot of you are probably interested. If you had bought at your entry signal at February 14th, 2019, you would not have had a sell signal until February 27th, 2020. The appreciation during that time was would have been from $45.12 a share to $53.82 a share. So that looks like a massive win. However, when you look that the first trading day of the year, January <laughs> January 2nd, 2020, the share price was at 71.90. Oh, that hurts to sell it at 53 when it was at 71.90 at the beginning of the year. But keep in mind, you bought it at 45.12 back in February of last year, so it's still a winning trade although you suffered massive drawdowns. <laughs> if we want to continue that to see how it plays out this year, there are two other trades that has happened this year, and that would be entering March 2nd, uh, you would have entered at $59.86 and then sold March 6th for $52.70. That's called being whipsawed. And then you would have bought again at $42.68 and you would still be holding today at $45.40. Today is June 18th, 2020. I did the math for you. If you had been doing this strategy, um, we'll talk it from February of last year until now, you would be up 0.62%, which is not awesome. But again, we have encountered a black swan event and overall the strategy has done very well. And I can see it continuing to work well in the future. I don't know the last time you've tried to compound 26% annually but it's it's astronomical it's something like a hundred dollars invested per month would give you 10 million dollars in 30 years you could do 200 300 dollars a month to double or triple those 30-year returns it's really kind of ludicrous to look at and what's even more ludicrous than that is to think that a ten thousand dollar investment would theoretically turn into 22 and a half million dollars in 30 years and for those of you who have no idea what a moving average is I'm going to jump into my phone, show you really quickly how you can set it up to monitor this yourself and conclude with a bonus tip. Let's dive in. I'm now inside the TradingView app. I've got SPY pulled up here, which is the S&P 500 ETF. Let me back out so you can see what TradingView looks like. Upper right hand corner, white icon with a blue cloud. Okay, I have one indicator and one indicator only, and that indicator is a 200 day moving average. I have a 1% band around that moving average. The moving average is the white line in the middle and you can see the bands to the upside and the downside. That represents a 1% move. The band to the top represents 1%, the band to the bottom represents 1%. And here's the pro tip. I recommend using moving average bands rather than just moving average, and this is something actually that Logan Kane recommended in the article. It'll save you from a lot of those whipsawing movements. So let's look here, we're in February of 2019. You can see, uh, looks like February 11th we hit that moving average but we didn't buy we went over it a little bit but we did not buy because we were not 1% over the price and then there we are 277 we're buying in so the moving average band will tell you kind of to buy whenever the price is 1% over the moving average and it'll tell you to sell whenever the price is 1% below the moving average. And that's just to cut out some of this stuff right here. Look on the right hand side, you see how that price fell below the moving average, but then it climbed right back up again. So you don't want to get whipsawed. There's so much movement, so many traders make moves around the 200 day moving average that you can have a lot of bounces over and under and over and under. And so there you go. That's the final tip with the moving average band. Final note. Don't buy when the stock price is way above the moving average. Wait for an entry. I would guess that on average an entry would happen 
a few times a year. So wait for an entry. What I would consider an entry is right here. Wait for it to fall below and then cross back above. If you find this video interesting or helpful in any way, please consider uh, subscribing to the channel, hitting the bell notifications to be notified every time I drop a new video. Smash the like button because because I hear it helps me a ton, I don't really know. But like I said at the beginning of the video, this is a, it's a unique strategy. And if you are somebody who is wanting to break out of the rut of buy and hold investing, potentially want to juice your returns, I, I know that with great risk comes great reward and with great reward becomes great risk. I just made that up and I, and I was tongue tied the whole time. But this may be something that you would want to consider doing with 5 or 10% of your portfolio, maybe more. I can't recommend that you do it. I recommend you do your own due diligence. I strongly suggest that you check out the article titled The Trading Strategy That Beat the S&P 500 by 16 percentage points per year since 1928 by Logan Kane. You can find it on Seeking Alpha. I'll also link to the Pension Partners Leverage for the Long Run in the description below. I'll see you guys in the next one.